Hi, and welcome to Color Your World. I'm Linda Fissler, and today we have a very special program. Uh, we have invited Michael Harding of Michael Harding Art Materials uh, with us today to talk. And uh, Michael's company was started back in 1982. He's been making oil paints since 1982. He studied in the UK, so as I said, it was a very special show because he's already came all the way over from the United Kingdom via Boston but uh, a long drive yesterday. So Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Linda. So we're very happy to be here Fun with you. Fun to be here as well. So, um, and you're gonna to talk to us about all the products that you make, yeah. uh, specifically oil paints, and we're gonna get into that in a little bit. But tell us a little bit about why you started to make oil paints. Well, as you say, way back in 1982, I was a struggling uh, student and was trying to find a way of replicating the paint surfaces of Rembrandt in particular and, and I would walk into our National Gallery in London and look at even just a, a, a brown black background of paint mm -hmm. and think why isn't my paint like that and I spoke to one or two college professors and they said of course at one time artists used to all make their own paint so I thought well if they can do it I can do it and as soon as I started making my own paint I suddenly was starting to get something recognizable of the surface of a Rembrandt dare I say <laughs> the genius wasn't there <laughs> but the, the paint started to be a little bit more similar. Okay, and when you said that you started to see, I'm t I suppose that you are talking about the texture of the paint, and we had talked a little bit earlier about uh, one thing about the Rembrandts that we had noticed of the eye sockets and the texture that he would have around the specific area of the eye, like underneath the eye and the eyelid and things like that. Indeed, but, but even if you were just thinking of the background, supposing I was the portrait, just even a brown background, just that actual paint surface, I could see I could not achieve that with the paints that were commercially available to me at the time. Okay, and is that because of the ingredients that were in the paints? Or? Yeah, it was, I believe it's because of the other things that are in the paints nowadays that shouldn't be in there. And those the are junk. the things that you typically leave out of your paints? Absolutely. People are often asking what makes my paint different and they, they recognize something but they don't know why. Yeah. So I explain it's not so much what I put in as what I leave out. And those things that you leave out are things like fillers and dryers and Absolutely. all of yeah. the bad things that make the batch maybe thinner in pigment, is that...? Uh, it displaces the pigment and therefore some of that luminosity, that in that chroma of color will go. Yeah, well, I'm going to be very excited because we're going to be actually squirting some of your paints out here and, and yep. working with some of that too. So, um, but tell us a little bit more about the, your philosophy. I'm sure that it's changed over the years since 1982. and. Oh. And you paint yourself, right? Of course, I'm an artist, yes. I try and, nowadays, I try and make a paint that not only shocks me with its vibrancy, but also shocks, if you like, my artists, my users. Uh, I want to literally have so much zing in these colours. So, well, really, if you think about it, you can always mute down a colour. You can't brighten it up. Right. Uh, so if you're starting from a bright place, then you have all the choices, technically. And you can't go the other way. Yeah, that's what I always tell my students when they're mixing paints, they always do something that we always call slam. And it's yep. because they take so much of the paint and mix it in and it's totally different from where they want it to go with their mix. And of course it takes a lot to learn. So as you, as I paint with Michael's paints now. I used to paint with another brand and it's taken me a long time. It, it took me a few months to get used to the fact that um, I only need a little bit of Michael's colors oh, to go yeah. into the other color because his pigments are so strong mm. and because they are lacking the things that we said leave them out. That's possibly if you're into mixing mine with another brand, it will embarrass the others. Yes, it does. Yeah. For <laughs> so. instance, a cadmium yellow. People often say to me, oh, I tried your cadmium yellow, but it went everywhere. I couldn't use it. And that's because the other colors are weak and therefore it has a massive tinting effect upon those. Yeah. So it's actually the other way around. It's the okay. others that have been embarrassed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm usually embarrassed when I was doing a demo, and <laughs> we talked a little bit about that this morning, about uh, C.W. Mundy's uh, actually demoed with some of uh, Michael's paints without using them. He was very brave without using them beforehand, and the amount of pigment that was in the t them yeah. and the fact that they were lacking some of the other um, things like the fillers and the dryers and the extenders. Um, he caught on with his 30 years of experience or more. He caught on very quickly what was going on. It took him two minutes. But it yeah. was a I, his heart was pounding, my heart was pounding, I was thinking, where's this going? Yeah, and then there's a famous quote that I always like to use when we talk, um, and that is the quote that's on your website about how you can um, not make us, what, a better artist? Uh, remember, but, I can't um, make you a Rembrandt, but right. I can promise it'll bring you closer to your materials and the old, the old em empathy, if you like, with the materials will be that much stronger. Right, and, and it's amazing, it is the, the difference that I see 
um, and the paintings that I've used exclusively Michael's paints on uh, have really, really shown uh, and really, uh, they have a pop to them and my collectors have started to notice that there's been a difference. They can't put their finger that's, on exactly what the difference is, but they certainly have noticed that yeah, there is a difference. That's generally what we hear all the time when, yeah. when artists give it a go. There's something they can't quite put the finger on, but there's greater luminosity there. I mean, I know technically what's going on there, right? but from an actual artistic point of view, the actual result and the painting appreciation is sometimes hard to put your finger on. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. So why don't you um, talk to us a little bit about, you brought us some pigments. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun to bring along one or two unusual things today. Um, probably to let sort of viewers know one or two unusual, uh, strange things that happened in the in the history of pigments and how people used to acquire colour years ago. Um, the particular three jars I have here. I mean, this one is made from quite a marvellous mineral. Some of you will know it as a semi-precious stone. It's lapis lazuli. Um, very subtle, very gentle, very beautiful, completely non-toxic unless you decide to inhale it, but um, and even then it's only because it's a dust, it's not because it's actually poisonous. And considering that's a ground up natural stone from Afghanistan, it's quite remarkable, has a very, it feels like sort of talc in your fingers, and I think even mm -hmm. you're wearing a bit of Yeah, I'm wearing a bit of lapis, I'm just going to put that right next to it, I don't yeah. know how close we can get to it or not, but this middle settled stone right there is lapis. I know. Can you believe that people actually waste stone on making it into jewellery <laughs> when you can, you can turn it into a painting? But anyway, you better take that back out, it, okay. might, get, it might get covered. Uh, I have also here some Indian yellow. Now, a lot of you probably have heard of this stuff. This is the real deal. You'll see Indian yellow in various oil paint ranges, and in, indeed including my own hair. This is a synthetic. So in other words, what we found here is a colour which closely resembles this guy when it's wet in oil. Now the method they used to make this was quite extraordinary. You'd take, rather you wouldn't take a cow, but you'd require a cow. You'd feed it mango leaves and you wouldn't let it have water. And after a while, of course, it starts passing a yellow paste. Okay. <laughs> and, which is this guy. And believe it or not, this is also very light fast. What they used to do was take this pea sometimes roll it up with earth and so it's sort of uh, into sort of yellowy balls and grind it up with oil and I don't know I hope they you can see that it is a beautiful color that question I hope you can there get you that um, but the curious thing about it is smell it Linda tell me what you it, I don't really smell anything like clay I can smell animals well yeah barnyard a little bit of barnyard maybe. yeah that's it yeah so that's the and you real... pay a lot for that in wine you know in wine. <laughs> the barnyard taste. No. Oh right, the farmyard taste, yeah. Let's just get it back on there. Okay, that's good. Um, this guy is also very unusual. This is made by myself. About 400 BC, uh, the Romans and other peoples had discovered that you can, you can create a white by suspending lead over vinegar and again using animal poop. There seemed to be a lot of animal poop around in those days for some reason. <laughs> very down to horse dung. Uh, in a container and after a while what happens is the, the surface of the lead corrodes and goes white. And if you think about it, in those days this was prior to the Industrial Revolution, they didn't have methods of factories making things for us. So I've started doing this again by suspending lead over vinegar in a pot and buried under horse poop. What's going on there is the, the vapours are coming off the, the vinegar, acetic acid vapours, and converting the surface of the lead into, in, into a lead acetate and then the horse poop, has to be horse poop because horse poop's got the highest level of carbonic acid of all the animal poops, I'm sure you already knew that at home, <laughs> um, convert that lead acetate into a lead carbonate. Now, the extraordinary thing about this is, this is, this is the white that artists would have been familiar with, very familiar with, up until probably the 1800s, until modern manufacturing or uh, industrial processes started to take over. And this actually is um, some, some stack lead. It's called stacks because they used to build these pots up in stacks. This is my stack lead white here. It has the most extraordinary handling quality, which I can demonstrate in a. Or, or that's yeah, got a bit ahead. of blue on it, so I'll just, I'll just do it with. Uh... When it first comes out of the tube, it's very short, and I think, Linda, perhaps you'd just sort of um, describe it. It's a bit like cold butter there, isn't it? It's yeah. It's fairly solid. Yeah. Now, the most extraordinary thing happens, and I hope we can get a, a bit of a close up on this. 
As I start to manipulate it, it'll actually change and become, I don't know if you saw that, it's gone from what we'd describe as, if you like, cold, it's doing it beautifully today, I'll say. Yeah. Must can be you, the can you see the, the streak? The it's, yeah. it's highly thixotropic. In other words, if means... you stir it, it goes, not runny, but it has more mobility. And when you see in a Rembrandt painting, or a, a Titian, or a Velasquez, those nice goopy brush strokes, this is what's helping achieve that. And you don't get that at all with the modern lead white, the ones, the ones that are industrially made, they're much shorter. And I don't, the more I do this, the more mobility it will have, until to a point where it can, and I haven't added anything here. There was this debate going on for centuries as to what Rembrandt particularly used to put into his whites to achieve the goopy quality that he appeared to get. And the answer was, he didn't. Yeah. This is it. It's gone from being that really short pace to now. And of course, I could put a drip of oil in and, and it would do it even more. So it's the, it's the handling quality, the texture of that that's so special. This has been a 17-year quest for me. To... This is marvelous, marvelous the way that, and, and you know that I've used this on my paintings. Um, and I'm a landscape painter, so mm. it's, I've used it actually to create like little nooks, nooks and cranny, crannies in, yeah. in the, well, my El Capitan and Yosemite paintings, mountain paintings, I find it wonderful for that as well. Yeah, we've a, a friend, uh, Leo Mancini Hareshko, and I gave him a tube of this. And then, and the next time I went to his studio, he came running over with a with a mm. landscape actually, and he said, "Look at that brush stroke. Can you see that? Can you see that? That's that stacked lead white. I wouldn't have been able to achieve that before." Mm. And you know what? It was it was literally one stroke of of a brush with a, it had been combined with blue, obviously. Right. But it just had this most marvelous, goopy look to it. But anyway, I thought it was just rather nice to be able to show you this today. Is so, it? and they just they would manipulate it with the palette knife like you're doing, or could would oh, they yeah. use their but brush to get in there as well? You've and got to remember, these guys. That's what they only worked with as a white. Mm -hmm. So they took those qualities completely for granted. And after working with them a few years, 30, 40, 50, whatever, <laughs> um, you just knew exactly what this guy was going to do. And so. In the same way that we're used to titanium coming out of a tube and behaving in a certain way, that this is how they expected their, their whites to behave. And it's, you know, it's almost getting liquid there now, but the way it just gets into a nice... It just holds there. Yeah, it just stays there as well. But anyway, so that's a, yeah. a stack lead white which we're making ourselves. So, so you have a fun job. You run around getting, what was this, cow urine? Is that what I don't know. I don't, this, this is just a, if you like, I inherited Horse poop. this. <laughs> So. This I inherit, I just want to get that lid on properly because otherwise it's a very valuable item to me. Right. I was fortunate enough to inher inherit that from um, a gentleman called Westby Percival Prescott, who was the chief, chief restorer at the London Maritime Museum for oh, a wow. number of years and he taught lots of people how to restore. And when he sadly passed on, I was able to get um, quite a lot of his pigments and uh, this is one that I acquired from him. Okay. So I, I see myself as the the trustee of it in a way. Okay, so you don't particularly use this particular pigment in your, but you no, use something no, similar no. with the same properties. What we've done is we've, we've found a yellow pigment, particularly an aerolide, uh, that has a similar color. Okay. If, the, if I made that into an oil paint, so I've, I've tried to replicate it, if you like. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, and then you wander, you wander around all of uh, England looking for horse poop for the stacked lead white. Well, the whole secret to good paint Glamorous making, job, you, Michael. You start with animal. No, no, joking aside. <laughs> um, yes, it is an unusual job. Sometimes I, 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 I do have opportunities to travel and look at pigments from weird and wonderful parts of the world. Um, other times, of course, things like cadmiums and, and cobalts and titaniums are readily available to all paint makers, and it's just a question of waiting for the calls to come actually from the pigment manufacturers often. Right. So um, the lapis then also comes from, are you still getting that from is it Afghanistan? or That one comes from Afghanistan. Okay. We were getting it from Chile for a while as well. Uh, lapis lazuli occurs naturally quite a number of places around, around the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, the famous source of course is the Afghan which was supplying Renaissance Europe, but in fact right time back to the time of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. um, that's the famous source. There are other sources, even California and Italy have some. Uh, uh, 
there's a, there's a famous mine in the Chilean Andes. Which, it, the unfortunate thing is it's 14,000 feet up oh. <laughs> and can only be mined for, I think, two or three months of the year. And there's, I think, also a dispute as to really who owns it. it. So yeah. there's, as if it wasn't difficult enough anyway. So, and we can no longer get that. But fortunately, as soon as that one became unavailable, this one worked out in my favor, uh, I was approached by a merchant who could sell me this, which, is, which was great news and rather a coincidence. Great. So, yeah. So, um, can we squeeze a little bit of the yes, of course. out and put it alongside? Should we put yeah. it alongside the? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have said before, and I don't know if I'm really correct in this, but uh, I know that you may be able to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Um, lapis was used originally by a lot of impressionists. I'm thinking mainly Claude Monet at this point, um, and then that was like the forerunner to ultramarine. Uh, that's correct, but I okay. wouldn't expect the French Impressionists to be using it because okay. they synthesized it in 1708. Okay. So, uh, it, because it used to be as expensive or more expensive than gold. Okay. And of course, therefore, the, uh, the, I think it was the French government offered a prize to see if someone could actually synthesize it. Um, and that's how we ended up with the French Ultramarine? Exactly. Ah. So the chances of the, of the, the Impressionists, it would be very unlikely, I'm not saying they weren't, yeah. It'd be highly unlikely. I would say that there would have been a, qu a very chick a quick changeover um, as soon as it was discovered. Ultramarine blue has a lot more tint power and is in some ways more beautiful. Mm -hmm. You've got to remember, this is nature's gift to us. The modern synthetic versions, of course, what I call a designer pigment, will have more, more clarity, more power. But this is very, very subtle. Um, as is this terra verde, it's, it's green cousin, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, also, oh, I, love this one. I have to, I have to squirt yeah, some of this do, one out do, because do, do. I do fun. love this terra verde. It, it's a wonderful color, and um, and Michael can put it on his hands if he wants. But yeah, he's <laughs> going to put it on. See if we, I don't gray. know if it would perhaps show better on this background. We can try a little bit there, and I can hold it at an angle as well. Scoop a bit of the lapis into it as well, because they really do relate so nicely together and when they when they mix together they almost become a landscape automatically. Go on really go for it. That's it. We can try and show that in the transparent there as well. You can see what's yeah. what's going on in some parts of the world, wet places like England, that's already a painting finished. Yeah. It's just there, the colours are always already there for you. Paintings almost paint themselves with that. And and again did you see how luscious his paints are and I love them. The sculptable. I mean, even without the stack, if you put the stack on there, it's even better. But <laughs> I'm going to put a bit of stack in, just rather yeah. than. I'll tell you what, I'll, if I may, mm -hmm. why don't I put a bit of rose madder in and, yes, uh, and see what other yellow I can put, and we can go for a, a flesh tone rather than maybe that just a landscape great. color. This rose madder is the real thing. It comes from a, a plant root. Um, I'm thinking what yellow would probably this one will go wonderfully. Yellow oak deep. People often say to me, you know, how do you mix a fresh Caucasian sort of shade? And the fast and easy method, I always think, is, is these three guys because they... There, it's there, mm -hmm. instantly. Just three colours. I hope you can see that. It's just... And of course you can get variations according to what the, the surface is. Okay, now the artist in me is saying, what yellow did you use? The yellow ochre? It was yellow ochre deep. Okay. Rose madder. Some and of my stack white. white. Stack light, yes. You would, of course, achieve it also with any other white. It's. Mm -hmm. um, I just went for it because it's there. But it's, and that's even before I start putting in something like what do we do it? Supposing I wanted to have a cooler area with a bit of shadow. I mean, look at that. Isn't that? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Isn't it's that? gorgeous. I mean, even as I look here, I can mm -hmm. start to see the, the the various shades that exist under your the, the shadow under your chin, for instance. Sometimes right. I can see here. It's, it's just. It almost paints itself. Yeah, it's wonderful. So rose matter is also one of your newer colors that you have it coming is, out, yes. and so is the stack lead. Yep. How many um, colors altogether do you have now? Oh, I think we're up to 84-ish, 84 84? but it's going up to 100 probably by the fall. Oh, I'm adding some rather interesting new things that I've found from various parts of the world, a, a French yellow ochre, an Italian green umber, um, some lead tin yellows, several shades of that. Yeah, we've, we've got lots of good things coming, and then there will be additions of, of some modern things like we've had requests from, for a, a quinacridone, which is a, a particular, particular shade, is a 
For those of you who know the colour index system, a PV19, which is a very special shade of quinacridone violet. So that's okay. one we're almost undoubtedly going to be adding. It's more on the red side and not the orange side, or...? It's a red. It's, it's a, a red. It's, 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 it's a red. red. It'll be okay. in, in the same sort of family as the sort of um, alizarins and quinacridones, the, the okay. magentas anyway. It's that sort of nature of colour. Okay, great. You have a commenced white that is in walnut and linseed? Indeed, but there's two. Those are industrially made lead mm -hmm. carbonate pigments. Uh, people often wonder why the two different oils. The linseed, of course, is the one which we're most used to, which mm -hmm. most, uh, most paint makers work with linseed oil. I thought it would be fun to put in a walnut-based one as well, since Europe used to work with equal parts of, of walnut oil and linseed. It has a different handling quality. It also takes up less pigment. So if I was to sort of hold two of the tubes in my, my hand, you'd notice that the one in linseed oil would be heavier. Okay. There's more pigment in it less pigment in the water. It's just simply the, the wettability of those oils, if you like. And the difference for the painter in that is, of course, that the, uh, the Kremnitz white in walnut oil would therefore be more translucent, more transparent, because it's got less pigment in. Okay. They're both made to the same criteria, but just to make it into a coherent paste that you're familiar with when you squeeze it out of the tube, mm -hmm. you, you need less pigment to do that with, with the walnut paste one. So a question I always wanted to ask, um, way, way, way back then, when, like maybe in Rembrandt, Rembrandt's um, era, they didn't have these nice little things coming in a tube oh, yeah. and already mixed up, and they had to know the chemistry of the paints, which absolutely helps. Did they actually like get pigment like this, mix absolutely. it in, linseed oil? Oh yeah, be before the likes of the big companies that we're still familiar with their names, mm -hmm. artists used to either have their, their, themselves making the paint or their studio assistants and they would start off with dry pigments like that, usually grinding in a pestle mort or on a, on a flat version, a muller and slab, and that paint making process would start every day and that paint would be used immediately. Yeah. And it was because their ability to get pigment in, they didn't have, they didn't have the same methods we have nowadays with mechanical stirring and things that look like dough mixers that can get a very high pigment load. They used to do it by, by hand and it would take, they could not get as much pigment in as we can. Mm -hmm. So generally what would happen is their paints would be more fluid after maybe an hour or so. It settles out and becomes much more fluid. Okay. So we have what, stabilizers or something now that keeps them suspended or? Uh, we, I have to put in a very small amount of a wax to keep pigment in suspension okay. within linseed oil, as does every paint maker. Okay. It's, the only trouble with that, of course, is if you put too much in, then it becomes technically an extender. It's there only to do the job of stopping it separating out. Okay. Think of it this way, if I put a handful of sand into water, not surprisingly it would sink. Mm -hmm. A handful of sand into oil would also sink. So if you can imagine filling your, your bucket of oil up to a point that there's sand, which is the same as yellow ochre pigment, mm -hmm. to the top, of course, and try and keep it in a coherent paste, those little bits of wax can make a vast difference to it, keep it more coherent. And you make all of these paints by hand? Oh, no, it would be impossible to do that. We use a small mechanical device called a triple roll mill, which does that grinding, as does every other paint maker. Occasionally, I will test something by doing it on, a, you know, on this sort of scale, would be done by hand, and it would probably take me, oh, half an hour to an hour to make as much paint as there is in, say, that half empty tube of rose matter. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very time consuming. Uh, I think you'll have seen today that when I talk about hand making, first of all starting walking around a field with a, with a bucket gathering up horse poop right. and manipulating things by hand, yes, I, 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 I'm about as hands on as a business can be nowadays in terms of making paint, but I wouldn't want people to think that every, single, there with <laughs> every single bit of Michael Harding paint is, you know, Michael's touched with a hand grinder <laughs> and stuff like that. But also I think you touched upon something quite interesting that about the tubes I want, you know, because before the, the collapsible tube was invented in the 1850s, they used to use bits of animal gut, or bladders, they used to call them. And I'm, I'm sure that when the collapsible tube came along, first of all, they were resisted because people say, like, I don't want to put my paint in that horrible, horrible container. We have a similar thing nowadays where I occasionally, um, in certain countries, I can't sell lead products unless they're in certain types of container. Right. So I have to put sometimes into those cartridge cans where you have to apply a, a gun to be able to squeeze it out. 
and people come to me and say, oh, I don't want that in my studio, I want a good old fashioned tube. <laughs> but the great thing about that cartridge gun is it, it, well, one means that legally I can sell the material, and secondly, every bit of that paint can come out because it's yes. a very powerful tool, and I can make the paint therefore thicker, which is generally what people want. Great. So we're coming up on time, and I saw you have a little pad here. Is this um, stack lead after it dries? Is that it what? is. I mean, I just thought it'd be fun to bring along and sort of show how the, the paint. Uh, I was trying to. I went. I was trying to replicate a, a Rembrandt there, and I don't know if it will show the the, the surface, of the texture of the brush strokes. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we should really do is have a David LaFell painting here. Then yeah. it would <laughs> then it show, really show, show what could be done. It just has the most marvelous brush quality and. I just thought it'd be fun to, to add it. Indeed, yeah. I thought it'd be fun just to add it to the uh, the collection, as it were, of colours. Yeah. So, so all the folks out there who like texture in their painting, the question you need to ask the artists that are painting and putting texture into it is whether or not they're using a stack of lead white, <laughs> because that will throw them off. <laughs> so, yeah. the next first Friday, everybody walk around and ask the artists if they use Michael's stack lead white. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Thank you, Michael, for coming all the way over from the UK to be with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for joining us as well. Um, next time, we're going to have another exciting show here on Color Your World. I'm Linda Fissler.